Okay, the next talk is given by Fabian Burgat about the modification of the Gordon Cutting model. Yes. Uh, so thank you for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to speak at this conference, albeit only digitally, but it's fine. Um, so yeah, this talk is based on some uh, lengthy article uh, that contains many more examples and some more results than what I will be able to cover today. But I will nonetheless try to answer the following three questions. So. First of all, what exactly is the cutting model and how does the modification that we look at work? Then uh, the second question is why could it potentially be interesting in particular? How does it relate to other models that people already looked at? And then finally, can we actually obtain results? So the setting is as follows. We work on some finite simple graph uh, connected for convenience. And in this graph, we uh, select a set of vertices and we will call them sources. And now what I do at each step is I select one vertex uniformly at random and I cut it, and which means I remove it. And this will potentially uh, disconnect the graph. And then there might be some connected components that do not contain any source nodes. And the idea is that anything that's not connected to a source dies off. So I remove it and I continue with the, uh, the remaining graph. And then I iterate this until at some point no vertex remains and then to stop because then I can't select another vertex. So this gives me some sequence of random induced subgraphs that decreases over time. And I should mention that uh, alternatively, instead of removing vertices one at a time, I can equip each vertex with, a, with an alarm clock. So for example, IID, uh, exponentially distributed random variables. And then I cut a vertex whenever the, the alarm clock rings. Uh, Benjamin talked about an earlier uh, talked earlier about the exact same idea in a different context. And this way you get a continuous time process instead and it's more convenient to work with this sometimes. So now uh, I can define, now that I have this process, I can define some functionals on it. The first one is very classical. So the cutting number is just uh, how many steps this process runs. So how many cuts do I need until the last cut removes the final vertex? And in the special case when I work on a rooted tree, this goes back to a paper by Marin Moon from 1970, where they just picked the root of the tree to be the, the one source of the moon. And now here comes the modification, which is introduce a second set of vertices, they're called targets. And this allows me to look at the first time when none of the targets are in the remaining graph, we call this separation number. And also because by that time, the remaining graph might not be empty, uh, it makes sense to ask, well, how does this little bit of remains look like? And then of course, both the, the cutting number and the separation number, when I work in continuous time, then they have their continuous time counterparts, which I'll denote by this uh, small sub C. Uh, and then I just ask how much continuous time does it take until uh, the corresponding events happens. And of course the, the graph at separation uh, remains unaffected in the change. I have a question. This clarification. So this target set uh, doesn't influence the process itself. So which components you keep or, or remove? It's just the, the time. It just defines the stopping time. Yes, that, that's that's a good point. The target set does not influence, as you said, the process itself. It's just to define this uh, stopping time. Separation. 
So let's look at uh, some simple example. We have this graph, the black vertices are the sources, the white vertices are the targets, uh, the gray vertices are just normal vertices. Um, this is at time zero, and the one indicates the first pattern to make this chosen randomly by me. So then at time one, we have simply removed this vertex. Now at time two, we select another vertex at random. And this time, we can see that the, the target to the right of this chosen vertex will also be removed because then it has no connection to any of the like, sources anymore. And then the third cut works. Similarly, the fourth cut hits the source. Um, now with the fifth cut, we have removed the final target. So this is our graph uh, at separation. And the separation time was five in this case. Now finally, with the sixth cut, we delete the rest of the graph and are left with nothing. So now the process stops. Okay. So first of all, here's a rather simple observation. The uh, separation time occurs before the cutting time, simply because if there's nothing left, then there's also no target left. But moreover, I have uh, equality between the two times, if and only if the sources are a subset of the targets. Um, and as it says, uh, the statement also holds true for a continuous time. So, and one of the ways to think about this result is uh, that this happens if basically the targets have distance zero to the sources. So the somewhat natural question is what happens to the other extreme if the targets are infinitely far away. The problem is this would require an underlying graph that is infinite. And then I can't select vertices uniformly random anymore. So what I do is instead I look at growing sequences of finite graphs that are in a suitable way compatible with each other, uh, but approximate an infinite graph. And in this way, I sort of push the targets away from the sources. So how does this look formally? Um, it's the following definition. So we have an underlying locally finite infinite connected graph with uh, two subsets S and T. And then I have a sequence of finite subgraphs. And I say the sequence exhausts G if the following two conditions hold. So first of all, the sequence should be increasing and together they cover the entire host graph. And then second of all, um, the set S is actually contained in all of these graphs and is the set of source nodes for each of them. And then the target sets, well, for the graph GN, this consists of all the targets that are already in the graph that I see, together with all the graphs that are well, still in the graph, but connect to something outside of the graph. Yeah. And um, in particular, I can now say, if I work on such a graph, and my chosen set of T in the infinite graph is empty, then uh, the contribution to the TNs will exclusively come from the second term. So as my graphs grow, these are pushed, this will be pushed far and far away. And then what happens is that um, you have this, uh, this connection between the side percolation on G and the continuous time cutting model, where the limiting probability that separation has not yet occurred is equal to the probability that uh, side population with probability e to the minus x contains an infinite cluster intersecting uh, the set of sources. Um, and the idea is to simply couple the two processes of so population and continuous time cutting. And then you use uh, the following two things. So first of all, all small graphs, they will be eventually contained in the finite graphs that grow outwards. And second of all, the uh, 
any infinite cluster that population could get. This will simply correspond to the finite thing that's seen by the GN uh, that's not being separated. Now, uh, let me try to answer the final question, which is how can we probably, how can we potentially approach this model? So what I'm going to look at is the graph that's left behind its separation. And the first observation is not any induced subgraph can actually occur then um, with positive probability. This is. So I call the one that can occur then admissible. And you can characterize those pretty easily. So it turns out that an induced subgraph is admissible if and only if it contains no targets. That's clear because that's the definition of the separation time. But also every component in it needs to contain at least one source node because otherwise that bit would have been deleted. And then I use this uh, curly AM to denote the set of all such subgraphs and uh, a bit more notation. So I have this partial SA. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, these are all vertices that are not in some subset A, uh, but they either belong to S or they are adjacent to a vertex in A. And the point behind this is if I want to see the graph induced by the vertex of A at some point, then I know that first of all, none of the vertices in A can have been cut yet. But also all of the vertices in delta S they must have been cut, otherwise they would still be there. And following through with this idea, we can give pretty explicitly an expression for the probability that the graph at separation is a particular admissible subgraph. Um, so let me, rather than reading through somewhat longer statement that we explain how this comes to be. So the, uh, the part with u to the u to the g here, this comes from essentially saying, okay, all of the vertices in g star must still be there. The next term with the one minus u to the uh, size of the boundary, this comes from, well, everything on the boundary must have been cut. And then uh, essentially the, the minus one here in the exponent and this last term, uh, and also the integral and the sum outside comes from me conditioning on, first of all, what was the last vertex to be removed before separation, and also the time at which separation occurred in the continuous time model. And then the idea is simply that immediately before separation, uh, there must have been precisely one boundary vertex still there. And through this boundary vertex, I must have had a connection from the sources to uh, at least the target. And uh, this is basically what this, uh, this probability inside the integral means. Um, but then I can use this because you see the probability that a specific graph across its separation might not be all that interesting, but you might be interested in the distribution of the size of the remaining graph. But you can then simply sum up over all admissible subgraphs. Uh, and if you do this, then you can get the following theorem, which is an asymptotic statement about tightness. So let's once again assume that we have a locally finite infinite graph G that's underlying all of what we're doing. And this one gets exhausted by some sequence of finite GNs. Um, and this time I have no restriction on the targets that being empty, so I have the subsets as in T. And what I'm then doing is I'm looking at uh, the sum, this, these are these AMNs, AMNs here. This is the sum over all the boundary sizes for all uh, admissible subgraphs on M vertices inside GN. And then because I'm interested in making N large, 
I define AM to be the, the limit as n goes to infinity for this. And then, so this is all the setup, and then here are the assumptions. So we assume that there are two constants B and L such that the following two conditions. So, so the first condition basically says that all sufficiently large uh, admissible subgraphs satisfy some type of uh, expander condition uh, because they have m vertices and then the boundary is supposed to be at least pm plus one. But then second of all, if I look at the generating function defined by the AMs, this function has a, a certain radius of convergence and uh, this particular integral is fine. Um, and of course, the condition of the radius of convergence is there just to ensure that uh, the integral is actually well defined, uh, possibly up to things so this uh, b to the b over b plus one to the b plus one. Uh, it's actually the, the maximum of the inner function in the integral. Okay, but under these technical conditions, it then follows that. Uh, the size of the graph at separation for the nth graph in the sequence. This is a, a family of random variables, and this family of random variables is tight. And why is this relevant? Well, it turns out that if I'm in a situation where I have tightness here, this in particular means that what remains at separation is very small. So then if I know the for example, the cutting number asymptotically, then I can transfer the result to the separation number because I know that there are only a few cuts left in separation to get the cutting number. So let's quickly talk about the proof idea. So first of all, I mean, I defined this limit, but it's not actually clear that the limit exists or is finite, but that is indeed true. And then, as I said earlier, so we use the, the last preposition and sum over all admissible graphs, graphs of size uh, at least m. And then with this expander type condition and some rough estimates to the integral there, uh, we get to this expression. And now, if I swap the summation and the integration on the right hand side, then I essentially get the uh, this function f and I get the integral from assumption two. So then I know that the right hand side is finite, which means that uh, the series on the right hand side must have had uh, tails that must have had a tail that converges to zero uniformly and n and this gives types. Okay. Now let's uh, let me conclude that talk by looking at an example. So I want to look at full complete binary trees. Um, but first, um, an observation that is true for, for rooted trees in general. So this returns to the classical setting where you take a rooted tree, the root node is my only source. But now to make it more interesting, I define some, some targets and this will just be the leaves in the truth. So then um, I can actually evaluate this probability. And uh, this probability is again the, the probability that occurred in the earlier proposition uh, inside the integral. So having this is useful. And it turns out that this is a, a polynomial in X that can be determined recursively. Uh, so see the recursion there. And TIs are, as it says, the rooted subtrees that you obtain by the, so the branches of the, the full tree. Yeah. Um, I should also remark that the coefficients of this polynomial have actually a combinatorial interpretation. Uh, they count the number of certain subtrees uh, up to a sign. Uh, and moreover, after a slight change of uh, variables and maybe additional one minus in front, uh, this polynomial occurred in 
not your works by the five others on transversals in trees. So there's uh, two papers from 2011 and 2013. So let's now look at the full complete binary tree. We have uh, two to the H vertices on height H. And then you can set up these polynomials and actually show that uh, these polynomials converge pointwise uh, against this function. And if you're familiar with side population on the infinite binary tree, then uh, the, this function phi might, might be familiar. And then using the, the proposition once again to full extend and summing up over all admissible subclass of size m, we actually get the limiting expression for the, uh, the size of the graphic separation. Now, it would be nice to simply use the earlier theorem, but in this case, it barely doesn't work. Um, but you can check by hand that, this, uh, so that these expressions here uh, indeed define a probability distribution on the non negative integers. And then, because you have made convergence plus no loss of mass, this means that you have convergence of distribution. And in fact, uh, with some technical pirouettes, you can extend this to just complete binary trees on n vertices. And then because we know that the, the trees at separation are small, we have the asymptotic equivalence that I alluded to earlier between uh, the separation number and the cutting number. And then it turns out that thankfully, uh, Sondi Janssen figured out the functional limit theorem for the cutting number in 2004. So we can simply copy paste that result to the separation number for, for binary trees. And of course, uh, there's a lot more you can do. Um, in fact, if you are looking for open questions, then the, the paper on archive uh, contains a list of those. So, but this uh, finishes the talk. So, we thank you for the attention. Okay, questions. Thank you very much, Fabian, for your talk. Are there questions? Oh, yes. Um, so, here you can study removing vertices and understanding the side population to remove edges and to see the bound population. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not catch that. Could you repeat? Oh, okay. So, I was asking, like, here you remove vertices and to see the side population. What if you remove edges and to see the bound population? Uh, so let, let me make sure that I acoustically understood the question correctly. So you're asking what happens when I remove edges and of vertices? Yeah, and also yeah. consider bound population. It's like in your talk, you consider size of the population. Ah, um, yes. So the reason why it's side population in the earlier result is because I'm removing vertices. Yeah, that's. That's correct. I guess the question is, can you say anything about one population instead of the same size population? Ah, okay. So, um, and if the question is about one population instead, then you would need to remove edges, but I believe the same result is still hold uh, in principle, and you need to change what, whatever needs to be changed. No more questions. Are there, are there any questions online? Okay. So thanks again.